Good morning. I am certain, with, I mean, I'm 100% certain that I can throw some fastballs. We're just going to pray that there's strikes today, okay? <laughs> Not wild pitches. Uh, man, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, it's fun. Um, the body of Destiny Life, the way that it is, and the churches we're connected with, and the two campuses. And this morning in uh, Alabama at Move Church with Jonathan and Jen Fox, who were just here for the conference. Michael and Marin traveled down to be with them there for this weekend, as well as Ron Jones from Florida coming to be with them down there as well. And then the Hots, who were such a part of this family in Altus this morning. And it's just, it's neat to see the body expressed in ways that maybe we don't always get to see in the Western world. You know what I mean? Some, it's, a, it's a portion of who we are and what we're called to and how God intended for the body to look that we just don't always get right. And it's exciting to be a part of a church that's walking into it in a way that's getting it right, you know, beyond just the, the Sunday morning walls that we show up to and then check in and check out that kind of thing, but a real body together, Christ's body. And so this morning we're, we're continuing in the series on saints, and this is a message about how the body treats each other. So let me just say this, the passage we're going to read today is very clear and the words are very clear and it's very strong. And, um, and I suspect, because this was my experience, that there'll be some things that Paul brings out today that are challenging to your heart and your behavior towards the body. So don't be afraid of that. <laughs> I'm thankful that we are not deciding if we are good or bad Christians on if we have room to grow. I'm thankful that Christ does not decide if he is accepting of us because we have more to grow. I'm glad that it's not on us, but that because of who Christ is and what he's done, that we are a part of this kind of a family in the spirit that we get to walk it out. So we're going to be in first Corinthians eight and, uh, Paul basically is going to dig into a principle of how we treat each other and why we should do that, why we should treat one another in this particular way. And so I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 8 all the way through. And I don't know about you and your personal experience reading scripture, but I've heard a lot of people say that scripture can be hard to understand. And I get that. I think that there's parts of the Bible that are a little easier to understand. It's why everybody, when you try to reestablish the discipline of scripture reading, you start in Proverbs. Who's with me? Uh, the, there's, there's places that are easy to get your mind around, but, but some places are a little tough. Today is not one of those places. This is going to make sense to you uh, immediately. And I'm going to try to read it as a letter written, which it is. I'm going to read it with inflection and intention and, and expression the way that I imagine somebody who wrote a letter would intend for it to be read. So it's 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8. There's only 13 verses. It'll go get through the whole thing right here, okay? Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. The ESV says, while it's knowledge that knowledge puffs you up, but love edifies Verse two, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. Amen. Um, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is no really a God and that there's only one God. There may be so-called gods, both in heaven and on earth. And some people may actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been sacrificed to idols, they think of it as worship of real gods. And their weak consciences are violated. A strong language, violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you, may, you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Cause others. That's an active, that's active language. That it doesn't cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their own conscience by eating the food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Jesus Christ died will be destroyed. 
And when you sin against, so encouraging people to violate their conscience is sinning against them. When you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something that they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. Verse 13, so if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I do not want to cause another believer to stumble. And the question for the day today is, are you willing to be a vegan for Jesus? Um, (laughs) Not exactly, but we'll get into it. So this passage is really interesting because it's saying something that is not really that confusing. It's that if there is a person who feels uncomfortable with some participation in the thing of the culture or the world or the things around them, if they feel a check in their spirit, if they feel a lack of liberty in their own conscience, then even if you feel liberty, it's sinful to try to transgress that and bring them along to your understanding. That's us trying to be revelatory instead of God himself to them. Right? Just because I have revelation doesn't mean that I'm empowered to reveal. Does that make sense? Because revelation comes from the Lord. So here's all these people in Corinth who are having to make a decision because what what would happen is people would bring meat to the temple. They would cut off a portion and they would sacrifice it to the idols. They would cut off a portion to give to the priests of that particular temple. And then they would take the rest of the meat and sell it cheaply to make money for the temple. But the temple was not a temple of the Lord. It was a temple of prostitutes and idols. And, And you've heard the stories of what that culture was like and what this particular place was like. And so for believers in that place that maybe didn't have a lot of money, the only meat they may get to eat is that meat. And so here they are reaching out to Paul. It's one of the things that they asked him, what do we do about this? Because some believers would say, it's okay. God is the one true God. We can go get this meat and it's fine. But other believers, maybe ones who were pagans that worshiped those idols that became believers would say, I can't go be a part of that. I feels, uh, I'm unsure of that. That doesn't feel okay to me. And there was conflict in the house. And so Paul was bringing order and the order is love your neighbor, right? Everything is summed up. (laughs) Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. And so we see that here, a call to one another, a call to care, a call to compassion, a call to like refraining of your own liberty for the sake of the people around you. We'll get to that in a minute. Romans 14 has a passage that, mirrors this. He's, he's, Paul's addressing the same exact issue in, in Romans. So verse one of Romans 14 says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Don't let that get to you. Don't argue with believers about what is right and wrong if they are growing in their faith. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything But another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. He goes on to talk about holidays. One day is not more holy than another, the same way as the food. And if you skip to verse 13, he continues and he says, So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause, there's that active language again, another believer to stumble and fall. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus, it's a big statement, that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. Not if someone believes it's wrong, then once they learn and grow and get your understanding about this particular thing, then they'll feel free to eat it. No, that will come from the Lord. It says, If someone believes it is wrong, then for that person, it is wrong. Now, this is the inverse of a verse in James that says, if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it, that's sin. But this is the opposite. If you don't think you should do something and you do it, then it's sin. And it goes on to get even more clear. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. That's strong. It's not just about your own conscience. It's about our impact on the world around us, the body with the decisions we make. 
Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. That's heavy. Guys, Paul is coming for us today. I don't know. 16, then you will not be criticized for doing something that you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a good verse. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. That's that same thing we see in Corinthians, that love builds up, not knowledge, love. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. This is a scripture that you see in the Bible Belt a lot where people will decide to not drink or to not have alcohol in their house or to not drink at a restaurant just because they know the culture and they know the, the, what people around them may struggle with or the, the perception of that or that kind of thing where they say, you know what, I'm just not going to participate in that. It comes right here from this scripture. You may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. <laughs> That's just good advice, huh? Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something that they have decided is right. And here's verse 23. This is the, here's the, here's the fastball. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. If you do anything that you believe is not right, you are sinning. That's pretty clear to me. I don't think that needs a lot extra to put on it. You know what I mean? Like this is, Paul is clear here. We see in the passage that this is both in Romans and in first Corinthians, the same principle is true. We as believers have a responsibility to each other. We know we have a responsibility before the Lord, but we have a responsibility to each other that is like acted out by the way that we live together, by the way that we move in our own life around the people that are moving in theirs in the body. And so when we are thinking about the things that we have liberty in, we have to consider the people around us. We're going to come back to this later, but the question is, is there a part of your life where you would say, I'm going to do what I want to do? And we'll come back to that. So here's the first question for today. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1, it says, while knowledge makes us feel important, the ESV says, while knowledge puffs us up, it is love that strengthens the church. So question number one, am I puffed up or am I building up? That's a hard question because it may not be obvious to you. It's not obvious to me. I can look at it and I can see, but there's been plenty of times that I was absolutely unquestionably puffed up and thought I was building the people around me where I was letting the world around me know my thoughts on something that they needed to know. All of my, you know, perspectives and opinions and, and understanding of some particular issue that they could apply to their life and, and if they would just do what I said, that everything would be okay. That kind of stuff. You don't always know if you're puffed up or if you're building. I'll tell you when you do know, is about two weeks after that conversation, <laughs> you can tell the fallout of all your bad advice and get in people's mess that you weren't invited into in the first place. Uh, no entrance and things like that. And so don't, <laughs> it's like, you have to recognize that this might be hard to see. So we have to really look at it. It may not be obvious. So you got to really measure so here's what we know. The difference between puffing up and edifying, building up, is the same difference as something that is, is built or inflated. So think about this building. When it was constructed, there's a lot of empty space in this building, right? But it's structurally sound. It's not vulnerable. It couldn't be dismantled in a single movement. Certainly it could be taken down, but it would be a long process. And if somebody began to take it down, they would likely be stopped before they were successful. It was built properly and we benefit from it. But if you take a balloon, for example, and you blow up that balloon, that balloon has volume and space and, you know, appears to be something might even be beautiful. Maybe it's your birthday balloon and it says happy birthday. And you look at that and you think to yourself, this is a beautiful balloon. And you've got this thing here that exists. Certainly it does, but it is vulnerable and it's empty. And what will happen is when it gets popped, what you'll be left with is essentially garbage. 
not things that were used to construct. So now apply that to our own knowledge, knowledge that puffs up. Have you ever had an opinion on something or an understanding of something that you were so tied to, it was part of your identity, that you were unwilling to discuss it with people when they disagreed with you? You ever felt that? That's a balloon. That's not a building. That's a balloon that you're protecting because it's vulnerable, because you don't want to expose it to any possibility that it could get popped because you've attached yourself to that thing. That's knowledge that puffs up. The puffing is internal. Building is external. When you build the church in love, you're building outwardly. But when you're puffing up with knowledge, you're focused internally for some kind of, you know, recognition or validation or gratification or to impress the world around you or something like that that would cause you to say, let me take this thing in me and overvalue it to a place that now I've misunderstood my place, right? So we don't want knowledge that puffs up. We want love that builds. Are we Christians that grow or do we just swell? <laughs> do we just swell up? So I did a little research on puffed rice. Who in here has ever had a Rice Krispie cereal? Has ever had Rice Krispie cereals? Who enjoys a Rice Krispie treat? Yes. Now, this is not a function of the, it being, the rice being puffed or not. This is more of a function of the, the other ingredients in a Rice Krispie treat. But who enjoys a good rice cake? <laughs> not quite as many people <laughs> as a Rice Krispie treat. Now, a few, I saw a few hands, and I believe that that's true. But it's not the same thing, but that's not the point of the message. I'm just pointing out they're not the same. Um, the point of the message with the rice cake is that it's made up of puffed rice in the same way. And a rice cake is roughly 15 times less dense or more empty than a piece of rice. Okay, so every piece of puffed rice in a rice cake is inflated to about 15 times what it was when it was a piece of rice. And what we know is that if you took one cup of rice, which is about 200 calories, the average rice cake is somewhere around like, uh, like it just depends. They're all a little different, but basically in volume, you would need 24 rice cakes to equal one cup of regular rice. That's a, that's inflated. You know what I mean? The, those two things do not balance. Now in Western diet, rice cakes often are used as what I can only describe as a trick. I'm going to eat a rice cake and feel full for a minute, but I'm not actually going to be full. The average rice cake has about 35 calories, but it's a lot larger than 35 calories of something else, like M&Ms, or some <laughs> other thing that I might snack on. <clears throat> and so you take this rice cake and it appears to be full, but shortly thereafter, we, you realize that it really wasn't. It wasn't really filling. It wasn't really there. And that's the knowledge. That's the knowledge that puffs up. Is It certainly exists, but there's no substance to it. It's empty. It's not loving. It's not building. So let's talk about love, what the cost of love is. How much does love weigh when you balance love on a scale? What balances with love? Well, we know, number one, that love weighs more than our own liberty. Right? And we see that right from the scripture. Verse 9 in 1 Corinthians, uh, verse 21 in Romans. It's clear that liberty does not equal permission. Just because you feel free to do it doesn't mean it's right to do. Doesn't mean you can do it before the Lord just because you feel right to do it. It doesn't mean that you should do it. In fact, we see Paul say in other places that everything is available to me, but not everything is beneficial. It's the same concept that just because you believe that before the Lord, you can do it doesn't mean that you have permission to among the body because of our responsibility to one another. Um, Paul says that we can violate people's consciences by encouraging them with our liberty. If somebody feels a check about anything and you tell them it's okay, that's violating someone's conscience. Does that make sense? It's not, this is not like a, you don't have to do like a big investigation to find out if you violated someone's conscience. You just answer that question. Did they feel a check and did you overstep? That's all. That is a violation. And it says that that is a violation against Christ himself in 1 Corinthians as well. 
in our liberty, we have a responsibility to refrain. So Luna Coleman, who's a member of Destiny Life, has been for years. She's primarily in, in Claremore campus. They are, uh, she's originally from Haiti. She moved here when she was a young woman, has a family, has three grown kids, has been a part of the church there for years and years. It's wonderful. But in Haiti, there is a culture of voodoo and witchcraft. Who in here has ever been to Haiti? I know there's at least a few. Yeah, I went in 2017. Um, you hear the drums. When you're in Haiti, you see it. You see the people worshiping. Charissa Coates has a story about the weekend before Easter one year, watching them march down on the day that Jesus died, celebrating his death in context of Easter. That they are like the, the voodoo and the witchcraft is so deep in the culture. It's so intense. So now as Luna raises her family, they don't participate in anything that involves any version of that. So what that means is that when Halloween rolls around, they don't participate. She's got incredible stories of parenting where she had to navigate that with public schools or navigate that with friends. One time, Eric, her oldest son, was in the youth group and we were playing a game. It was a charades game with movies. They'd have to act out movies. And the movie that I gave him to act out was Jumanji, which to me is just a movie. But that movie involves lots of spiritual things and witchcrafty things and a game that comes to life and things like that. And Eric told me, I've never seen that movie and I can't watch it. And I was like, why not? And he explained, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. I had to back off of that. It would have been so easy to say, oh, it's so, it's just a movie. That would have been transgressing. Or to say, oh, well, I mean, I understand, but you're missing out. How mean, right? Like, but no, there, there was a line drawn. It, was, it would have been a transgression. And I, I saw it. And I backed off and I apologized. That has not always been the case in my life. I did okay on that one. <laughs> um, and so Luna is not a new believer, but because of the life that she has lived and her exposure to those things, it informs a lack of liberty because of what she's been exposed to. And I imagine in this time in the church in Corinth, it was the same thing, that there were believers who had worshiped those idols and they become believers and they're like, I, look, I get it. I know there's just one true God, but I can't go back there. I can't be a part of that. And as believers, we have to bear that up with one another. So love weighs more than our liberty. Love also weighs more than our own knowledge. Now this is important because knowledge isn't bad. Paul is giving knowledge in the passage, right? Like he's explaining, he's teaching. Knowledge is not wrong, but it is wrong when it leads to a feeling of superiority. Have you ever thought, have you ever like known something and you felt good about it when the people around you didn't know? Here's a good example. Have you ever been watching a movie and you figured out the twist before anybody else? That is knowledge that puffs up. <laughs> that makes you feel all big. On the, you're like, I saw it coming. I knew what that was. That's like, that's the kind of knowledge that puffs up, right? And so we don't want knowledge that makes us feel superior. That's wrong. That's not helpful to the body. That doesn't build up. We don't want knowledge that overpowers our love, right? If knowledge displaces or overpowers love, that's a no-go. We can't do that. The knowledge that has the right facts, but the wrong heart, can't do it. It's a heart issue. It's not a facts issue. It's a heart issue. You, everybody in this room has somebody at their workplace that you love but you think if they only knew and it's an enormous temptation to get puffed up instead of just to love them. This is a real challenge with application across our life. Love also weighs more than our own opinions or our perspectives. I, um, I love food. I love all kinds of food. If there's meat and cheese and bread, um, those are my favorite foods. And I love getting a good deal on food. When I was about 11 years old, 12 years old, I rode my bike to KFC in my hometown and I ordered some food and I ate it and I had a dollar left over and a dollar was going to buy me two biscuits. And I was like, I'll get two biscuits. I'll ride home. I'll have biscuits for later. My little 12 year old brain solving problems. And I went to the counter and my friend was working. He was 14 
which is crazy, but in Arkansas, who knows? And he's a 14 year old working the counter at KFC. His name was Jacob. And he was there. And I said, Jacob, here's a dollar. Can I get two biscuits? And he said, sure. And he got the box and he turned around and he got the biscuits with the tongs and he held it over the box and he smushed the biscuits. He just shredded them into the box and he folded the box up and he slid it to me. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, those are my biscuits and I've paid money for them and I love biscuits, but Jacob was bigger than me and he was kind of a bully uh, as, as per the smushing of the biscuits and I didn't know what to do. And so I was like, thanks man. And he's like, I'm just kidding with you. And he opens another box and he got like 12 biscuits and jammed them in. Now, let me put context to say, I realized that was wrong, but he gave me the biscuits and I left with the biscuits. <laughs> And I realize that that's wrong, but let me tell you, this is not a joke. From that day forward, I get free food at fast food all the time. It doesn't matter where I go. I walk in. I have a hilarious story with Chick-fil-A with Michael Black, where they apologized for my food taking so long, gave me coupons, gave me extra food, delivered it to me. I ordered before, I think I ordered after him, and he still didn't have his food while all this was happening, and then they just brought him his food. And they were like, I mean, it's everywhere. I call it my fast food anointing. Um, <laughs> my point in saying that is to get to this next story, which is I have lots of coupons. I've got food apps on my phone. I've got coupons that get mailed to me. They figured it out. And, uh, and so one place that has incredible coupons is Arby's. Arby's has <laughs> spectacular coupons. They're incredible. And there is a lady... I'm, you can get a two for dine at two, two can dine at Arby's for less than $10 and get a smorgasbord of roast beef and curly fries. Um, but this girl in my office was trying to save money. And she told me, she said, I'm trying to save money. I'm nervous about eating lunch. Cause I have a bad habit of going out to eat and I don't want to be spending money on out to eat food. And so I'm going to start bringing my lunch and that kind of thing. I said, Hey, that's great. But just so you know, I always have coupons. So if you decide to go out to eat sometime, I do have some for you. And she said, well, that'd be great. And so one day she says, Hey, I would like a coupon today. I need to go get some food. I didn't bring anything. I said, Hey, I got Arby's right here. And I gave her the coupons. She took them. She left. She went to go get food. And when she came back, she was really upset because they were expired. And she got, I'm sure knowing her that she got in the line, she went through the line, realized they were expired, didn't just, you know, leave or anything like that, but ordered a regular meal, spent more money than she probably had to spend. And it was just, I mean, it was a giant bummer. So she comes back, she tells me, hey, I'm sorry, these are expired. Here you go, gave them back to me. And I said, they don't care. And I went on this tirade about coupons and how, they could care less. They probably have the current version of the coupons behind the counter. Just give, they probably don't even check. I've, my parents own a restaurant. I've worked in restaurants. If you ask the person, they're just going to give it to you. They're looking to make things easy. And I just went on and on and on to her about this. And it did not occur to me until JC told me later um, that I was transgressing her conscience, that she had a thing that said, these are the rules and if you do it this way, you will break the rules. And she said, I can't break the rules. And I'm like, of course you could break the rules. And so the, just because in my heart, I have the full liberty before the Lord to use expired Arby's coupons, she doesn't. And even in that, we can't transgress the body. Even in that, you can't overstep because that is such a core part of who Christ says that we are is the Holy Spirit in us, our conscience, the, the personhood before the Lord that we have. We don't have personal sovereignty. He's sovereign, but we are, have our own personal like personhood before him that cannot be transgressed. It's why socialism is, is nearly evil because it takes somebody's personal like sovereignty, essentially that they exchange for money with their work. And it takes from that. It's a transgression of somebody's labor, essentially, in the same way that this would be a transgression of somebody's conscience. And so we have to remember that love weighs more than our perspectives and our opinions. Here's another thing. Opinions are not truth. They're just our idea of how we should apply the truth. So when you have an opinion on something, maybe that's a good idea of how to apply the truth in your life. And maybe there are other people who could apply it in the same way that you have. But that isn't true. It's just an idea of how to apply the truth. And we can't take that and like push that onto people either. So Paul uses some interesting words in the scripture here 
strong and weak. And I want to give definition to that because that's hard if you are the one that he's calling weak. That doesn't feel good. So let's talk about it. Weak in this scripture is not weak in the sense that you're a bad Christian or even a new believer. Take the example that I use with Luna. She's not a new believer. She's a leader in the church. But in this one area, she would have what Paul is calling a weak conscience that can't stand up to this thing that she's experienced or idea, you know, the, the, her personal life experience with this particular issue. So he says, Romans says that they're weak in faith, not saving faith, but in faith and believing that it's okay for them to do it. I can't be a part of this. So for me, this is important too. It's not weak in self-control either. It's a lack of liberty. So because of my history with sexual sin and pornography and things that I've walked out in my life and in our marriage, one of the things that I have to do is be very careful about what we watch on TV. There is a hard line in our house that is drawn on those things. JC has to bear that up with me. She may feel full liberty to watch some particular show or something that I may say, I can't watch this. There may be things that in this room that people would not see any issue with that for me, I can't watch. And it's not because I don't have self-control or that God hasn't delivered me. It's because I have a weak conscience when it comes to this. And I can't overstep that. When I was 10 or 11, uh, I, I watched on TBS a movie at that time in the early 2000s that was about witches. It's one of those, I don't remember which one it was, but there was a bunch of them right then. And it scared me so badly that from that point to today, I don't watch movies about spiritual things. I don't watch scary movies. I don't watch paranormal movies. I don't watch anything that's related to like spooky or hauntings or things like that. There are even sometimes that thrillers get so intense without a spiritual aspect that I don't watch it. That's because I have in my own conscience, it doesn't stand up to now, do I know that that stuff is not real and it was a movie and I watch other movies? Of course. Do I know that I have freedom in the spirit to overcome those things? Of course. I have been in environments where actual demons were being engaged and I didn't feel weird about that. But taking myself into a place to watch a thing and be entertained by a thing, for whatever reason, for me, my conscience is weak there. Now, here's what the scripture says that is also very interesting it talks about the strong in their conscience, that the strong correctly perceive the truth that's spoken in 1 Timothy 4 and in Romans 14 that says, everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. And in Romans 14, it says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. So someone with a strong conscience says, I see those scriptures and that's true to me. And I have full liberty to participate. I have full liberty to have a glass of wine with dinner. I have full liberty to watch The Bachelor. I have full liberty to do whatever thing it is that I want to do because to me, I do not feel convicted or challenged inside of this thing. I feel liberty. But he also says something really interesting about the strong is that the strong are to accept the weak and to love him as a brother and don't look on him as inferior. So here's the question when we ask the, like, how should the strong and the weak interact with each other? That's the challenge to us today is how are we interacting with one another? How are we as someone with a strong conscience versus someone with a weak conscience? How are we living life? Because there's a real challenge. Now, before we get into this last piece, I do want to say this is only talking about issues of conscience. This is not talking about sin. Sin is not okay. Sin is sin is sin. And now we know that if you know you shouldn't do something and you do it, it's sin, right? That's sin. We, we're not, theft is not an issue of liberty. Adultery is not an issue of liberty. Obedience is not an issue of liberty, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about issues that relate to maybe cultural things or uh, the things of, of life that some people would feel a check on that others wouldn't, but not of sin. So Paul says to the strong brother to accept the weaker brother Love him, don't look at him as inferior, and don't regard him with contempt. There's a responsibility there that's interesting. And to the weak, the person with the weak conscience, he says, don't judge the person with the strong conscience. So even though the instruction to the strong 
is to adjust. The instruction of the weak is if they don't, don't judge them. That is joint supplies joint. You know what I mean? That is a picture of the body is that the one person who's supposed to do the thing and doesn't do it, that the other person bears it up, even when they were supposed to do it for that person. So together we walk that out, we carry it. We, we, we need each other in that way. Um, I want to step into a hornet's nest. Please, 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 nobody get your feelings hurt. We're going to talk about Harry Potter. I can't think of a single cultural event in the Western church in the last 25 years that has drawn a line like this has in the church than Harry Potter. And if your house was a house that said, it's okay, it's not a big deal. And if your house said, we will not participate in witchcraft. You know what I mean? And I'll bet if I asked you to raise your hands, which I won't, because that would be a transgression of conscience, (laughs) that you would be able to say which house that you grew up in. And you would know. And I'll bet if you are being honest that you had people in your life on whichever side that you were on, on the other side that you judged or you looked down on because they did or did not participate. I did. (laughs) In my house, I was allowed to read Harry Potter. I read it in sixth grade. (laughs) Hold on, I got it. Here we go. But here's the next one. But I was not allowed to watch or play, play Pokemon. My parents had a check in their spirit about Pokemon and the Simpsons and whatever else they decided, but not Harry Potter because they correctly perceived the truth that this thing was not evil in itself and they felt the liberty, but this thing over here, I don't know, maybe it's evil. We're not going to be a part of that or whatever. And so it's like every house has these things and the church has these things and there's lines and there's culture and there's people and there's, there's individuals who are like feeling the weight of this in their circle. If you were the person in your school that couldn't read a book and everybody else could, that is a great burden socially. If you were a person in your circle that could be a part of something while everybody else couldn't, that is an enormous trap to bring people along into a thing that they shouldn't be a part of. And it's like, there is no safe place from, I'm free from any issue here. Wherever we fall, the Lord has a work to do in our heart. So here's the last thought for the day we wrap up here. If any part of our life, come back to this question. If any part of our life says, I'm going to do what I want, run from that thing. Run from that thing. If in your marriage, you say, I'm going to do what I want, run from whatever it is that you're talking about. If in your workplace as an employee, you say, I'm going to do what I want, Stop it. If you're an employer or a boss and you say, I'm going to do what I want, do not do that. Before the Lord himself, if the Lord is asking things of you, you say, I just can't do it. I'm going to do what I want. Stop doing that. Because that is this idea of it being inward, not building up. We can't focus internally and be the body. The joint does not supply itself. Joints supply joints. The body is in order because we need each other, not because we can take care of our own self. And so when it comes to this kind of thing, we have to be honest with ourselves. And it is hard. And it doesn't feel good to be honest with ourselves because our flesh is dying. And it hurts. But this is how the body is built up. This is how love is shown. So here's what I'm going to ask you this morning. Can we play a little music? I don't know if uh, there's some house music or something. Um, Here's the question today. Just close your eyes where you are, bow your head. I know that already this morning there are things in in your house. Oh, thanks, Joel. There are things in your life that you know already that 
you are participating in that people around you feel a check and you've continued, or you know already that there are things that you don't feel like you can participate in, but you've been pressured to by the people around you, or you know already that the Lord is reminding you of things that he has told you before to draw a line where you haven't drawn a line. I, I, we know, I know that the Lord is speaking to us this morning. So ask yourself the question officially in your heart right now, am I saying I'm gonna do what I want? Is there an area of my life, whether it's in family, marriage, work, among the body, in obedience before the Lord, where you would say, honestly, I'm absolutely saying I'm gonna do what I want and disregarding the people around me. And I would include in that, if there are things that you're participating in that you have felt a check about because the other people around you do. Maybe you know because of your family's background and the things that you struggle with that you don't need a glass of wine at dinner, but you don't wanna make everybody else feel uncomfortable. So you participate. Maybe you know that you shouldn't watch those TV shows, but Everybody was really looking forward to it. And I didn't know that that scene was gonna be in there when we went to the theater. And, uh, and so it's gonna be okay this time. Like whatever that thing is for us. And I just wanna pray for that this morning. So I'm gonna ask you if you'll just be bold and honest. If you would say there is an area in my life that the Lord is showing me right now, I want you to just stand up. And I'm just gonna pray for everybody that stands. If that's you, just stand up and <laughs> No pressure is between you and the Lord. He's gonna get you if you're sitting down anyway. But if you wanna stand up, this is your chance. I wanna bless us and pray over that this morning. Dear God, I thank you so much for the body. I thank you that you have put us together. I thank you that you don't leave us alone, not alone from you and not alone from one another. God, that you've designed us to be together and that you've given us instruction on how to be together better, that you allow us to be in family, to be in the body, to be in the church, to minister to one another, to receive from one another, to pour out and to get back, that joint would supply joint. I pray for all of those standing that would say, there is an area in my life where I have been inwardly focused. Maybe I've been puffed up. Maybe I've disregarded an instruction of the Lord. Maybe I've disregarded the body around me. And I pray, God, that you would give them the encouragement and the life and the boldness and the instruction and that the ability to walk it out and to make that adjustment. God, I thank you for everyone in this room that is laying their life down for the people around them. I thank you for every husband in this room that is laying his life down for his wife. I thank you for every husband in this room whose flesh is dying because of what he's being asked of him before you. I thank you for every wife in this room whose flesh is dying because they're committing to go deeper into what you have for their family. I thank you for every parent and every child in this room that is being turned towards one another in, in the opposite spirit of their flesh to be drawn together. God, I thank you for every person who has gone too far and repented and come back and said, I shouldn't have said that. I thank you for every person who's heard unwise counsel, who's, who's had somebody overstep and that protected that person in their heart and who said, I, I know what they intended, but it didn't come out that way. God, I thank you for the body and how the body has a way of bringing healing and encouragement to itself, that you are the great healer and that through us, you move and that you bring peace and you bring life. Like that verse, God in Romans, it says the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that this morning. I thank you for this house. I thank you for these people and the families represented. I pray today that you would be with us, that you would bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, Trevor, are you back there? I had an encouragement for you. I heard the Lord saying that this is something that you're very good at, that you're very thoughtful about the people around you, and that there are times because you're so thoughtful that people take for granted that it requires something of you. 
And there's a verse in Galatians, Galatians 6, 9, and it says, don't get tired of doing the right thing for at the right time, you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. And I just wanna tell you that your goodness may not be recognized in moments, but that it is recognized in the spirit and the kingdom and that you're doing a thing that means something as you consider the people around you, okay? I love you, Trevor. Um, as we leave this morning, would you everybody stand up together? As you go home, just ask yourself the question, am I puffed up or am I building up? Do I discern the people around me and feel encouraged and, and encourage them? Or am I looking to do something for myself, self-satisfy in some way? The, the balance, the seesaw of our love versus our liberty, is it tilted the right direction? Ask ourselves that this morning. Um, before we dismiss, I, I do wanna give a couple announcements and, and then we'll pray that table in the lobby is a CCS table. If you haven't decided yet um, schooling for your children this fall, or if you're interested in what uh, a Christian education looks like, or this ministry that's a part of DLC that has been for years, if you want to know more about it, uh, please stop by. I think Carla will be there at the table. Um, there's several people here that either attend CCS or teach at CCS. There's a ton of resources uh, that can answer your questions, but definitely stop by and learn more about that. Um, Christ College tomorrow night is the Old Testament survey uh, that's beginning. Um, it's been awesome so far. If you have any questions, make sure to go to the website, check that out, be a part of that if you would like. Um, and uh, also, as we're wrapping up this portion of Corinthians, we still have a lot more to go. And there are some books, some journals uh, at the, the bookstore that you can get that have passages with places to write notes. You can take that and write your own notes in it. If maybe you're the type of person that doesn't like writing in your own Bible or things like that, that you want a place to write notes, we have a resource now that you can grab and that'd be awesome. And then finally, just to add to what Brian was sharing about the discipleship track, I would just encourage you, be a part of that if you never have. And also maybe if you have, the discipleship track is really cool because 101 is such baseline Christian truth. It's just the basics. And we might think to ourselves, you know what? I already know all that. But imagine, think about as we become more mature and grow in Christ and understand new things, how much more robust and, and we can draw from the basics as opposed to what we might've got the first time through. And so even if you've been through it before, maybe the Lord will prompt your heart to be a part of it this year, to jump in and be a part of it again because of some new fresh things he wants to bring to your heart. That starts Wednesday night. Uh, there's plenty, like if you miss this week, you can get involved in the future too, uh, but make sure to be a part if you can. The 101 starting uh, there which would be fantastic. So let me pray for us and then we'll dismiss. God, I thank you for today, for this house, for these people. Thank you that you speak that as your children, as your sheep, that we hear your voice, that you speak to us. God, I ask that, uh, that you would be with us this week and encourage our hearts towards building up the body, that you would help us to build up those around us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.